So good morning and welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to this webinar on connected and automated driving, driving in cities. Uh, it is about the question, how can cities prepare for it? Thank you for joining this webinar. We have a large number of participants, 55 at the moment, but we have many more uh, registrations. Um, so we shall see how people will come on board in the next few minutes. Uh, this webinar is organized by the Satellite and Coexist projects. Uh, both are Horizon 2020 projects. Siegfried Rupprecht, I'm the director of Rupprecht Consult here in Cologne, and we are both we are involved in both these projects. Um, we have decided to invite for this webinar uh, because we think there is a great need, um, which we saw when we talked about automation in previous conferences in Civitas but also in SUMP uh, and in other contexts. Uh, before really going into the substance of the meeting, I would like to show you a little bit the functionality of our uh, webinar system. Uh, if you have problems hearing or if you want to talk later, we recommend you to dial in. There is a list of uh, numbers, uh, which are free numbers in some countries. So please uh, check this out. Secondly, you will see uh, during the presentation a poll box um, that you can also see in my presentation here, where we will ask you questions. We will be starting in a few moments with that. Uh, please remember to mute yourself um, unless you're muted as everybody is at the moment by default. But when, you, when I unmute for questions, remember to mute you back so that you don't hear background noises. Uh, finally, uh, there is a very important box. It is the question box in the right bar on the, in the bar on the right hand side, where we encourage you to put questions uh, throughout the presentations. Uh, one of my colleagues will be monitoring these questions. He will respond to some uh, if they are not clear enough, and we will bring them up later um, during the course of this webinar. Um, so, um, one more point uh, for information, if you're interested in the agenda, uh, it is in the right-hand corner accessible for you. And of course, at the end, we will give you a link for the handouts. This is the team of this webinar. Cyrus Gomari is in the background. He's the question and poll manager. Uh, Daniel Franco, uh, sitting next to me in charge of technology, and my name is Siegfried Rupprecht. Uh, we have three great speakers, Dana Czerczaj, also based here in Cologne, with me, Brian Matthews in Milton Keynes, and Adriano Alessandrini from the University of Florence, but today based in Rome due to the uh, snow in Rome. So, here is the uh, structure of our webinar. Uh, after this brief introduction, uh, Werner Czerczaj will talk about automation. How far are we? How can we start planning? We will then take the example of Milton Keynes, a mid-sized city that is preparing for connected and automated driving. And then the third presentation from Adriano, what is the role of automation in public transport? We hope to have enough time for a lively discussion at the end. Um, for questions, please be reminded again to use the question box at any time during the presentations. After each presentation, um, I will open the floor for a few minutes um, of questions. We suggest that we read out the questions in the box, but if somebody wants to speak, then you can raise your hand through the system and then we can, can connect to you and hope that the transmission works well. Um, in the end, of course, uh, a block of questions. Can I now ask Cyrus to start the first poll question? It is basically about who you are, so that we understand a little bit who's joined. 67 participants we have at the moment. So please, everybody, if possible, uh, make your choice. Uh, this is a very All right, now, now I've seen 50% have voted. 
Let's wait a few more seconds. Mm -hmm. It is always good to know who's on so that we can maybe uh, remember this when we ask questions or we put the focus of presentations. Are we good okay. now? Sirs? Now we um, have 8%. I'm going to close the poll, share the results. Okay. So can you summarize for us, please? So 15% are urban transport planners in public authorities, 27% consultants, 2% from uh, the public transport operators, 29% from research institutions, and 27% from others. Okay. Yep. That is a that is a good mix of the community, the transport community in Europe. Um, do you have another question for us? Um, I mentioned the Civitas program. Cyrus, can you open the next poll? Just to know how familiar you are, how much you know about the context of this webinar. It's a simple question. Cyrus, how are we doing? Okay, now we have 85%. Okay, mm -hmm. I'll, cl I'll close the poll now. It's... Oh, okay. So, so well, more than, a bit more than half uh, actually know about Civitas. Okay, that is good to know because we're always eager to reach new people with our events and, and material. Uh, I, now, I now move on uh, just to give a very quick introduction to the topic. Uh, we all know about the various expectations that people have of automation. It ranges really from support for aging drivers uh, to serving certain areas better, saving costs, increasing safety, space. I have tried to order these positive points, maybe how in the in the order as they may materialize in reality. But of course, there are also very um, difficult points, uh, maybe negative points. Uh, the most important topic that we can see in this list is that we are unclear about the impacts. So. It is really uncertainty is the main topic when we talk about impacts of automation. What you also see from the list and from what you know about is that uh, very often people talk about automation with a mix of different technologies and also different timings. So for us, this is uh, really enough reason to think about the practical question, what can cities do? And in our webinar, we really want to follow the aim of contributing to an informed debate, starting a discussion among stakeholders on the European level, and actually helping cities to prepare policies. I mentioned the agenda, so I can move on to Bernard Jajai, who will build directly on what I just said, uh, and I will invite him to present. So Bernard, please take over. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Siegfried. Uh, my name is Bernhard uh, Jajai. I'm a colleague of Siegfried at uh, Ruprecht Consult, and I am in this context a project coordinator of the Horizon 2020 Coexist project that mainly deals with the issue of urban mobility in urban transport planning. It's great that so many of you uh, have joined um, today and given up your lunch time, or maybe you're having your lunch at the moment. And um, so far we have 68 uh, participants. So the title of my presentation is basically automation, how far are we and how can we start preparing? And when I mean we, I mean the sort of whole ecosystem that is based around urban transport planning. So it's good to see that there's a lot of cities present today, some consultants and research institutions who want to discuss the topic. So my agenda for the presentation is basically I will discuss terminology a little bit and the technology. Then I will look into the uncertainties for Civitas cities, but also this addresses all types of cities. And I will introduce you to the concept of automation readiness for cities. And we'll mention some very concrete automation ready measures and policies that cities can 
to take today in order to become automation ready. But let me start with a short um, poll question, um, just asking about your experience and your knowledge, how would, would you rate it for urban transport automation? Okay, so the scale is basically from beginner is one and then expert is five. Mm -hmm. Now we have 75% of the votes in let's wait a few more seconds see if we get more answers all right i see that it's not changing anymore so i'll close the poll so yeah okay um, about a quarter are actually just beginners and another quarter uh, say they're about intermediate and 10% of the attendees are actually experts on the topic. Very, very impressive to have that many experts also present today. Uh, but of course, the most uh, people in this field, because of these uh, many uncertainties that exist in urban transport automation, are basically more beginners or building up a knowledge base regarding automation. So let me just start uh, basically um, with the, what is the public image of urban automation. And of course, all of us have seen the so-called Google car, which is a, a vehicle designed for sharing. And it's a sort of a robo taxi that could replace the use of private uh, vehicles. The other view on automation that is very public is, are of course, these automated shuttle services. And this is what Adriano will also mainly talk about in his presentation. It's about how to automate public transport vehicles. And then the third picture, uh, public image of automation, is the many see the have heard stories about uh, auto, uh, the hands-free uh, functionalities of a Tesla vehicle, where you can basically give over control to your own privately uh, owned vehicle. The other sort of um, aspects of automations that are not uh, debated so much in the public or that many people are not aware is basically that a lot of the intelligence in order to have good automation would sit more in the roadside infrastructure. This is often called like CITS or so cooperative ITS uh, solutions and um, also the communication between the vehicle and other vehicles, which is V2V or with the infrastructure like traffic lights, so V2I. Or there's the other thing like communication of the automated vehicle with, um, with X, so it can be any other devices, so V2X. So for example, a pedestrian could even wear a device in the most extreme case. And then there are also some more exotic solutions that so far have not been publicized very much, but they're also a plausible solution to deploying automation in cities. So, for example, Nissan actually works on a concept which is called human in the loop automation, where, for example, an automated vehicle is driving the city but has some problems navigating itself due to unexpected roadworks or an accident. And then a remote driver from a traffic control center would take over that car and drive it around the obstacle. So, there's a number of different uh, sort of uh, technological possibilities. And the question is really, which type of vehicle will you see first on your road network? And to be honest, I cannot provide you with that answer. And I don't think many can provide you with that answer today because it is not clear about which, um, which technology will actually at the end win the technological race and which will appear in our cities. Then looking into the terminologies that uh, are often related to automation, I think most of you are familiar with the so-called SAE, um, levels of automations. SAE stands for the Society of Automotive uh, Engineers. And the scale basically ranges from zero to five. Um, zero is basically where you drive uh, yourself an old vehicle and there's no kind of uh, assistance system supporting you. Most modern cars today already have level one or level two functionalities. And we, when we think about uh, fully automated public transport vehicle or the Google car, then we are kind of moving into the level four and five where there is no driver and the driver becomes actually more of a passenger. But very important, um, and I think in the public de debate, uh, one aspect is not mentioned when you talk about SAE levels, is that each SAE level is really dependent on the operational design domain of where the vehicle 
is meant to, um, to drive. So for example, uh, a vehicle today can achieve SAE level four in the right operational driving domain so a public transport vehicle, for example, but this would require significant changes to the physical and digital road infrastructure for it to be able to function. Also one important aspect to explain is that the change between level four and five is actually quite dramatic because level four is kind of full level automation, but in one specific um, operational driving domain, but level five would mean that the vehicle can drive anywhere without actually having been without having uh, adjusted infrastructure, physical or digital infrastructure. But moving on regarding the SAE levels, it's actually from an urban transport policy context, so from a uh, Civitas context, it's, uh, SAE levels are actually not that relevant um, as many think. The main reason for that is, is that the SAE levels come really from a vehicle engineering perspective and they describe the interaction between the driver slash passenger and the automated vehicles. But they do not describe the operational purpose of the actual vehicle. And um, I will explain to you what I mean with operational purpose but, uh, in the next slide, but I want to say here that I don't believe that any city will ever develop policies based on SAE levels but the policies will be more based along the potential deployment paths of automated vehicles and how these vehicles are going to be used. So if we look into the three most basic scenarios that exist for automated vehicles, we have the automated private vehicle, which is basically a continuous uh, development of driver assistance systems that currently exist in cars. And then the vehicle will become more and more automated. Um, this uh, will then most likely lead to a shift to more automated privately owned vehicles. And the result of that is that vehicle miles traveled will, of course, increase significantly because the privately owned car will be more attractive. Another scenario is um, basically that automated vehicles will not be owned, but they will be shared. And those will have a SAE level of four or five. The vehicles are available on demand and there are empty rides possible so that they can redistribute themselves depending on demand. And this will hopefully uh, decrease then privately owned vehicles and also reduce, reduce the overall number of vehicles in a city. And then there is the scenario looking into automated public transport. So where little public transport uh, automated vehicles can act as a feeder to the core public transport network. And this would hopefully then make public transport more attractive. In a survey of the 24 largest German cities, um, they were asked about which of these three, now, three scenarios they would prefer most. And of course, um, all cities said that they would prefer the second and the third scenario the most. But then they were also asked which one of these scenarios is most likely to happen first. And then all of them clearly said that they worry that the automated private vehicle will first take over their cities and in that way making the car even more attractive. So let me ask you the next poll question. So when do you think you will have uh, connected and automated driving widespread in your city? Okay, we're half of the participants have voted. Let's wait a few more seconds to give them time to estimate this. All right, about 90% have voted. I'm closing the poll now. All right, so about 20 30% think it's zero to 10 years from now, and about 42% uh, believe it's gonna be 11 to 20 years, 23% think, or 30% think it's going to be 20 years and beyond. So these are their estimations. Okay, um, yeah, that's, I think uh, um, the results sort of, um, confirm also my uh, um, understanding about when the first vehicles will uh, enter the road network in the cities. Um, could I have the presentation back? Okay. 
And uh, this also goes along the uh, predictions from uh, that are done every year by a company called Gartner from the US, their technology consultancy. And they um, issue every year the so-called hype uh, cycle for emerging technologies. And right on top of this uh, hype cycle last year in July, at least there was uh, the automated vehicles, which basically the peak shows, uh, it's called the peak of inflated expectations. And uh, Gartner, at least, they suggest that at the moment our expectations from the technology are far too inflated and that there is still some, uh, that our expectations will have to go down and we have to actually come to realization what this technology can provide to us. But we've talked a lot about the sort of technological uncertainties that exist uh, for cities, but what do they actually mean concretely? So, for example, what, what can cities do now in such a hyped environment? Because there's so many uncertainties about the availability of the technology, the functions of the technology, and for example, the impact on safety. And what is the time frame for implementation of this technology? So level five sharing systems might still be far away, but level four public transport with adjusted infrastructure is actually possible today. And what is the, and if we decide to have level four public transport vehicles, what exactly are the infrastructure requirements, the, both the physical and the digital infrastructure requirements? And how do we organize ourselves in this very long, messy transition period where we'll, we'll have normal vehicles, levels two and three vehicles, and then maybe already some level four vehicles all mixed on one road network? And what is the overall impact for cities, specifically on vehicle kilometers travels? Will they increase or will they decrease? But this list can, of course, go on. But the real effect that we can identify today, the, the, the result of these uncertainties, is that at the moment, connected and automated vehicles are not mentioned in transport plans or in sustainable mobility plans or other strategic planning documents. So for an example here, we in Coexist, we have four partner cities, and here are the planning documents for two of them, so Gothenburg and the city of Stuttgart. And both these documents are meant to plan the transport network until 2030 or 2035. And when you search for the word of automation in both these documents, they actually don't appear once. So how are cities meant to plan for this, for this expected technological developments, but if they don't actually have mentioned them in their strategic planning documents yet? So the next poll question is, has your city, or are you aware whether the city where you live, basically, has, have they included or start preparing for uh, connected and automated driving? Okay, now we have about 70%. Seventy-eight. All right, I'm closing the poll now. If there are not more answers, okay. All right. So actually, the majority of our participants uh, say they do not know, or it doesn't appear in their strategic transport mobility uh, strategic mobility plans of their cities. Okay, that's very interesting. So for those who said that they already have a high degree with detail or some inclusion, then I would be really interested to hear from your example. So please uh, share those documents with us, either through the chat box or just by email afterwards. Okay, but then moving on. So if we identify a problem that, as you, uh, that uh, CAVs are at the moment not mentioned in planning documents, but then the other question is, what kind of policy goals can um, CAVs actually support for urban transport planning? So again, I'm referring to the survey of uh, the 24 largest German cities, where they were asked to mention the most important po urban policy goals that they are following at the moment. And you can clearly see that uh, most German cities, which I think is a kind of a good example for all over Europe, they want to promote cycling and walking at this moment, or they want to support uh, public transport. They want to reduce congestion, save energy, 
shift to more sustainable modes and improve safety. And then they were asked about what they actually expect automation can contribute to each specific policy goal. And here the results are a bit uh, negative. So for example, German cities at the moment believe that um, automation would have a negative impact on cycling and walking, a negative impact of public transport, a neutral impact for congestion and energy saving, a negative impact on um, the shift to sustainable modes, and only one positive um, effect on um, better safety. So there is a, clearly a discrepancy between um, what um, the industry sort of expects from automations and what uh, cities at the moment expect what automation can contribute to their uh, policy goals. So the, so the next poll question is really, what do you think? Can automation really support the city mobility goals and sustainability goals? Okay. So. Fifty percent of the votes are in. Seventy, eighty. All right. I'm going to show the results. So, uh, four percent say no. It is against some of our goals. Six percent say uh, the disadvantages outweigh the benefits. 60, about 60% 60 say yes, but only in very specific contexts. 9% say yes, it supports all our goals. 22% are uncertain of how automation could support, or would, will support uh, their mobility and sustainability goals. Okay, that's an interesting result. So the clear majority says yes, but only in specific uh, contexts or under specific conditions. So then, yeah, that's the question. How do we create these specific contexts and these specific conditions? And that is exactly the aim of the Coexist project uh, that I am coordinating, where we really want to systematically increase the capacity of European local authorities and other mo urban mobility stakeholders to get ready for the transition towards a shared road network with increasing penetration rates of um, CAVs. So what do I mean here in this context with um, automation readiness? And currently we have a definition for it, um, which um, we're of course also consulting with a number of stakeholders um, currently. So at the moment, automation readiness is defined as conducting transport and infrastructure uh, planning for automated vehicles in the same com comprehensive manner as for existing modes, such as conventional vehicles, public transport, and so on, but while ensuring continued support for existing modes and higher level mobility goals. So currently we're going through a stakeholder consultation regarding this definition. So I would be also really interested to hear your feedback on this definition. Maybe you can send it by email after the uh, webinar, because we are aware that this definition might have to, have to be um, adapted for specific modes. And it might also need to be uh, adapted over time, because maybe at this moment, cities cannot become automation ready or they should not become automation ready but there's more of a drive towards cities should become automation aware. And concretely within Coexist, um, we tackle three uh, aspects of automation readiness. So first of all, it's automation ready transport modeling, because currently at this moment, it's impossible for cities to actually simulate uh, automated vehicles in their transport models. Um, and this is what we are changing. So after the project, cities will get uh, default behavior parameter sets that they can apply uh, to simulate automated vehicles. We will look into automation ready road infrastructure. We will come up with some design suggestions um, in regarding to automation. And uh, we will also work on creating automation ready road authorities. So for that, we are currently elaborating eight use cases in Gothenburg, Helmond, Milton Keynes and Stuttgart. And with these cities, we are developing so-called automation ready action plans. So concretely, the Coexist project at the moment is working on uh, creating an uh, automation-ready framework. 
This will encompass uh, guidance on issues like technology impacts and measures. And this will then help cities to make clear-headed decision, uh, uh, clear-headed and informed decisions about automation. And we're also creating an automation FAQ for cities. So basically um, collecting the most basic questions regarding automation. If you have any questions, then please send them across to you and we will try to answer them. And the first uh, version of this uh, framework is currently being developed and should be released to the public within the next uh, two months. And concretely, we're also working on automation ready action plans with our cities. There we want to create a bottom up local stakeholder process through automation ready fora, where we will consult with local stakeholders on identifying measures that cities can do today in five years time or in 10 years time in order to become automation ready. And we hope that these action plans will become a sort of an annex to uh, strategic transport planning documents or SUMPs. So what sort of measures can cities take today, maybe in order to reach automation awareness? And here it's really to start a good informed stakeholder debate about technology and potential risks. And this is also what Brian from Milton Keynes will uh, briefly mention. And it's also important to kind of understand the potential contributions of driverless vehicles to the city goals. And it's also important to create a communication and cooperation with other actors interested in automation. So for example, cities should also actively search for a dialogue with vehicle manufacturers. And potentially you could already plan and implement pilot measures and uh, testing different types of vehicles at this stage. So moving on, I think the most important thing that cities can also do today in order to rather support the uh, shared automated vehicles is to already promote sharing um, today. So for example, with car sharing facilities. So to create a new mobility culture that is really accepted by the, uh, by the citizens. Then moving on, looking at the time, I don't have to, uh, enough time to go through the entire list, but what cities can do in the medium term, so maybe in the next five to 10 years, are aspects such as to integrate uh, automated vehicles in their transport demand models, to work on um, predictions about what the impact of the technology will be on travel demand. Um, then moving on just to the uh, final prediction, which is what can cities do in the next 10 to 20 years time, which this phase we can call basically automation implementation. And this is where really cities should start with institutional adjustments. So to see what uh, kind of uh, organizational structure do they require. So for example, they could think about creating a specific department for mobility as a service. And only also in that period, we would suggest to start with infrastructure adjustments. And they're really the most basic infrastructure should be looked at, like for example, road markings or speed limits. And then to look into what the purpose is of collective mobility services, where can automation support these services? And that's when I think it's also only in that period, the uh, tendering of automated public transport vehicles becomes relevant. So these are basically the, uh, the sort of measures we are suggesting uh, in the framework. We will of course uh, describe these measures in more detail. And uh, we're also um, looking forward to hear some of your ideas for measures that cities can take today. But uh, as in the conclusion, we can say that cities should act now in order to become automation awareness, to, uh, automation aware. And um, it is important to create a policy framework in order to um, support, uh, to inhibit inefficiencies and frustrations that might be created. And it's also important to understand that the SAE levels are not that real important for policy making. Um, and it's important to create a common vision for automation and uh, goals um, in order by, for example, integrating automation in sustainable urban mobility plans or other uh, planning documents. So thank you very much for listening and back to secret. <laughs> okay. Many thanks, Bernard, for this clear presentation. Uh, can I ask Cyrus, um, are there Many questions. How are we doing with the interaction with the audience, of which we have 73 participants now, 68 uh, non
non organizers well, one question came up uh, during the poll question uh, from Stein is it he he was asking which city has a SUMP with high CAD integration so uh, the, the, whoever the participant was it would be good if you could uh, type this in into the chat function mm -hmm. so we would know which city this is okay so maybe these the the participants wants wants to make up his or her mind uh, and identify him or herself and then perhaps we can share the information i'm sure this would be appreciated by everybody participating mm -hmm. okay um we're a little bit delayed so i i would rather move on our next presenter is brian matthews um and i'm trying to persuade uh, my presentation to move, um, which I could not. Um, okay, now we are. It's coming. Okay, um, again, Brian Matthews. He's the head of transportation innovation in Milton Keynes Council, uh, a project partner of Coexist, uh, and a great presenter. Mm -hmm. So, Brian, um, how are you doing today? Are you good? I'm very well, thank you. It's a beautiful sunny day, although it's cold in the UK, so it's a, it's a lovely day to look out of the window and, and participate at this at the same time. Okay, so great. Over to you. I'll switch myself off um, and you have the floor. Okay, well, well good, good afternoon, everybody. It's, it's a real pleasure and, uh, to, to have the opportunity to speak to you uh, today and uh, allow me to tell you a little bit about what we're undertaking in Milton Keynes. Um, I don't seem to have control of the screen. I'm very sorry for that. No, you should have now. I was slow. You are okay. I was slow. But it's, it's good now. You can see the screen now. It's going well, Brian. You can continue. Okay, and you have to I can continue. Okay, you can see my screen now. I've just I've just lost a little bit of feedback there. So, in in terms of Milton Keynes, perhaps it is best if I I start a little by uh, explaining where we are in the UK. Um, Milton Keynes is, as you can see from the plan, is, is around midway between London and Birmingham on very good strong uh, transport networks, radial routes out of uh, linking our cities. As a new town, we, 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 we started in 1967. Uh, uh, we were a greenfield site at that time, and the city has developed now to a, a population that's close to 270,000 people, so fairly rapid growth uh, over, over the past 50 years. Um, perhaps this is illustrated with, with the next uh, uh, slide that shows that growth that, that was continued and sustained for that period. Uh, and we're talking in, in number terms around 15 people every day in Milton, Milton Keynes. And with the growth of the city we, uh, and the, its strong employment links, we import 25% of our, our workforce, so around uh, 30,000 people a day to come and work in the city. So a very successful new town in the UK context. And it's been recently identified within the, within the UK context uh, as a strategic uh, area for the continued development of the country's industrial and housing strategies. So linked with Oxford and Cambridge, the, the growth in the area is going to continue. And when you think about that, 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 that presents a challenge for us and also perhaps opportunities. As a planned city, we, we reached our, our planned status in about three or four years ago and everything's working pretty well. Uh, we, are, we generally have low levels of con uh, congestion, uh, no air quality problems and generally mobility is pretty good for everyone. But with our plans now, we, we're looking to develop the city to double in size over the next 20 to 30 years. Um, and, and that will present challenges for us uh, and we need to think about how, how we deal with those as because there's a great appetite within the city to, to continue its successful growth and development. 
So it was very important for us to set, set this into a context of, of a futures plan, looking very much into the future. And whereas that, that slide only says 400,000 people by 2050, since this report was published last year, uh, we've got an appetite actually to go to 500,000 people. And, and it's starting to think about how the city can develop and its plans are emerging for the future. And within this, the strategic futures report, which was put together and um, perhaps explained by an independent commission. So it, it includes not only the elected representatives of the local authority, but also uh, a, a, a widespread of academia, industrial experts, community experts to put it together and, and really try to answer what, 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 how do we make a great city even greater? And within the context of this, uh, this report, we identified project four, which I'll come on to in a bit more detail a, a little later. And this is about smart shared sustainable mobility. So really look into the future. And it's interesting in the poll answer that the, the 30 year horizon for more connected autonomous vehicles entirely fits in with our planning that we're expecting that to happen within our city by 2050. And happily that, that, that detail is now cascaded into a council strategy uh, uh, with, with the detail emerging within within this program and it's interesting to note that this this strategy is no longer called a transport strategy it's a mobility strategy and it really embraces new technology looks at the mobility as a service uh, concept endorses fully the use of technology as a primary tool to support mobility and just starts to look at the transition goals and the business cases around this so this plan it really covers a, a shorter time horizon but really sets the council stall out for how it will transition from where it is now, business as usual, around the traditional modes of transport, to start embracing the new technology that's coming, coming along. I think we've probably already answered this question, so I don't know if we are going to run this question again. It's around the sustainable mobility plans and how much detail is included in preparing for connected and autonomous driving. We can show the results, Brian, if you want to see them. Yes, if we can show the results again, that, that would be useful. Mm -hmm. so yeah, the results of the questions were 56% of the participants uh, don't know or uh, they don't have it at all in their SUMPs. Uh, a few, 27 percent say this is being acknowledged in their plans. About 15 percent say there's some inclusion with limited detail, and about two percent of the participants say it is uh, included with a high degree of detail. Okay, that, that, that is it's interesting, and as, I suppose from the context of the UK and my contacts uh, around Europe, that, that doesn't necessarily surprise me because this is an emerging technology uh, and, and ideas. And but I do think there will be a rapid uh, increase in, ex, in the interest in putting these plans within urban mobility plans as, as we move forward. And looking at how we're looking that in Milton Keynes around in, include them in, in the future plans, we undertook a, a piece of work that we, we try to roadmap to the future in the context specifically of Milton Keynes. So this is where we think the, the technology is developing in, in our area. Uh, and you can clearly see there's a timeline running up to 2030 in line with our plans. And we're really starting to think about how these will now feature in some detail in our, in our mobility plans. But as you can see at the little diagram towards the bottom of the slide, we are in a period of, of, of guaranteed uncertainty. And perhaps what I can do now is talk a little bit around how Milton Keynes is trying to remove some of that uncertainty by some of the work we are, we're doing within, within our projects. So I'll, I'll focus on, as I say, to, to look at how we can look to get a little bit more certainty, but it's by no means guaranteed. And in the specific case of autonomy, and if you don't mind, I'll use a use case of the UK Autodrome project, which is underway in Milton Keynes. 
Now, this, this project is a, a co-sponsored uh, initiative by the UK government and the partners you can see on that slide. But the partners made up of, of, of in three, four areas, really. The OEMs and manufacturers, so we have Ford, Jaguar, and Tata Motors providing uh, vehicle technology. We have academia through the universities of Cambridge, Oxford, and the Open Universities based in, Mil in, in Milton Keynes. Some advisory roles from insurance companies and technical companies such as AXA, uh, the uh, MIRA, which is our research association, TALIS, which is looking at security, and some from the, uh, the legal side of Raglan and Scram. And one other important company is RGM, who are making our low-speed autonomous vehicles or pods. So this program is, is, is valued around £20 million. It's, it's uh, under, currently underway. We're, we're close to the end now. We're, we're two and a half years into the project. And we're about at the sharp end of demonstrating some of the capabilities that are coming through from autonomous vehicles. With the project has three facets. I'll, I'll just explain those very briefly. One is to, to deploy real autonomous level three, four vehicles on open roads within the city, and they've been provided by the manufacturers. A demonstration of a public transport system within Milton Keynes. And finally, a, a research program that is starting to answer some of the questions we, we're posing to, to start to look to remove some of the uncertainty I mentioned. But perhaps it's important just to, just to emphasize the role that the city has taken in leadership in this program. The picture there is of our council leader who is very pleased to have a, one of the first goes in autonomous vehicle with, within Milton Keynes. And so the, the, the council, the city is setting the agenda with some very high level support from partners from the university research. Uh, sector. Well, the primary aim of what we're trying to look at is to look at the long-term benefits and application of autonomous vehicles to the urban environment, but specifically within our city. So the hypothesis we've said, uh, it, it suggested that connected and driver's cars could have a significant impact on providing safe, efficient, low carbon mobility to the public. And the four areas that are generally cited as where the benefits lie around safety, where it is suggested that perhaps up to 90% of accidents are currently caused by humans within the driver. Productivity, that's the amount of time that we potentially waste in the driving function. Typically in the UK, the uh, average time in the car on the commute is two hours per day. Capacity, the idea that self-driving vehicles can be more efficient in using the road space and in terms of mobility, can mobility be improved for those who are currently deficient in the current transport systems? And the key questions very specific to Milton Keynes is that we're answering within the research element is, is taking a snapshot for the future. If we had 100% autonomous vehicles, what would be the impact on congestion within our city? Remember going back to the scenario where we're looking to double in size and that generally means a double in, in transport demand. What, if any improvements would in mobility would the first and last mile transport system within the city center context uh, delivered by small vehicles sharing surfaces, could that deliver for the city? And what is the business case for this low speed autonomous transport system? And importantly, what's the public view and what is the direction of travel in their opinion? So perhaps we could launch a, a, another poll question. Uh, what do you think are the primary reasons for developing connected and autonomous uh, vehicles within your city or your experience? All right. You can select all that apply, all that you think are the reasons for developing CAD. We now have about 60% of the votes. Let's wait a few more seconds. All right, now I'm closing the poll. 
So in the order of the ranking, the majority think the first reason would be improving safety, followed by reducing congestion, followed then by increasing mobility options, and then improving productivity. And about 8% of the answers were none of the above. Okay, that's that's really interesting. Now I'll perhaps come on to some of those results uh, when I talk a little bit about the public attitude surveys we've run here in Milton Keynes. Mm -hmm. So, in, in specific detail within the uh, project Auto Drive, is to look at the improved capacity, the the headroom on our roads through through um, the widespread introduction of uh, self-driving vehicles. Uh, our approach to this is, is, as I said, to take a snapshot in the future of what, what the capacity would be. And to achieve that, we, we've looked beyond, the, I suppose, the realms of the Coexist project to look at the, some time in the future, perhaps 30 years in the future, with 100% uh, penetration. And to do that, we've created a VISM transportation model that's working clo in close collaboration with the vehicle manufacturers to, to import some of the features of the vehicles, their performance into our modeling. And we should be reporting the results of that within the next couple of months uh, to show what, what is happening there. The second ap application is to deliver uh, a low speed pod service within the city center environment of Milton Keynes. Now these vehicles will be uh, small vehicles carrying up to four people that can operate on shared surfaces uh, of footways with, with pedestrians and cyclists. And the basic principle around this is to try to understand the features, the facets, the issues with developing an on-demand anywhere-to-anywhere service within, within a, a relatively small area, but with great densification coming along. And again, the practical prior issues we want to look at is if we double in size of the city, we need to use a land space that we currently give over to car parking for other uses. And how do we then maintain mobility within the center? So the technology is looking alongside the real practical application of a future use within the city center environment. Uh, this service, as I say, will we'll start to launch in demonstration more mode in June, July this year, and we'll be deploying up to 40 vehicles operating on a typical working day. And as, as I say, we, we're looking to learn and understand the potential future business case around this. Uh, a further aspect, and it's, it's very important to, to remember this, we, we do have to work with, with the public and understand their views as a city authority. And I've just thrown up a snapshot of a, a national survey we've been involved in, in, in understanding what, what the views are to, of the public. And we're taking this snapshot picture at the start of the project, and here are just some of the basic results that came out of that survey. And we'll be also undertaking a service towards the end of the project to try to understand if the views are changing. Our initial findings are that the, there is a, a, a mood within the public that hard opinions haven't yet been set, and there's general positivity around the notion of self-driving vehicles, and we need to understand uh, if that's going to be maintained. Uh, and and in, interestingly, in turn, line with the poll results, uh, the, the area where the public felt there was less benefit was around productivity and they wouldn't use their time in the old autonomous vehicles other than to look out of the window. So they, they're grabbing some relaxation time back. And the link there is to the, the Auto Drive website where you can get all the detail of the 49 question survey that we undertook uh, around a year ago now. And so if I can just uh, wind up a little bit on, on some of the lessons learned through the Auto Drive and our experience in in, in Milton Keynes is it, we have to recognize this technology is still in development and perhaps some areas are not as mature as you would have you believe when you, you read all the press around uh, some of the initiatives that are going on. Uh, the legal regulatory insurance issues are very important, but they shouldn't be seen as a complete barrier to moving forward. Uh, we found insurers, legal partners, regulators want to help. It, it, it is after all their future business model. 
And similarly, the car manufacturers want to work with cities to get an understanding of what could be very key to their future markets and business development opportunities. And having cities set the agenda is a real positivity for them. And again, so perhaps uh, some words, uh, if you don't mind, on considerations for other cities, other areas, is, is to take a, a advantage of the position city have in driving the agenda forward. As I say, it's a business opportunity for many out there, and more and more we're finding partners want to work with the city authorities in common shared objectives and goals. Again, understand what you want to achieve from the, the, the technology, the development, and tailor that through, through your local plans, and then demonstrate how it can accelerate your, your wider object, objectives around developing your areas. Collaboration is very key, uh, and it can bring funding or business opportunities with partners. So, so widen the normal scope around how cities work with other wider partners and it has brought fruit certainly in the Milton Keynes context and again there's great excitement at national level through government and industry so it, it's good to work with it at a national level to support your local agenda and the last point is is take advantage of the general support that's being shown from the public our service uh, suggesting the jury's out there and uh, it's an ideal opportunity to work with the public so in summary, I, I think for a city, it's providing the clarity and leadership in setting the agenda is important. It has to deliver the, the local objectives for it to, to move forward for cities. Uh, actively exploring the use of technology it, it ensures a city to, can develop in line with short and long-term visions. We've moved a long way away of the predict and provide models way we build infrastructure, build our way to out of trouble. I don't think that's a sustainable way forward in the future. And start making with the plan making to, to work at a detail level uh, to enable the deployment of technology. So that, that was a, a, a bit of a quick canter through what we are undertaking here in Milton Kings. And so thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to respond to any questions now or later in, in the morning. Thank you. Many thanks, Brian. This was a great presentation. There was one concrete question to you, context question. Uh, it is about the modal shift, especially the share of cars in your city. Could you respond to that, please? Yes, the, the modal shift is very highly in favor of cars. We, we're around 85 to 90 percent some days, certainly for commuting. Uh, the design of the city was very much focused on supporting that as a mode of transport when we laid our plans in the 1960s, when some of the issues of congestion air quality weren't quite thought about. So part of our strategy is to work with the car uh, and other initiatives in the city are, are looking to remove the carbon and autonomy and shared use is another way of achieving the shift away from some of that single mode. Mm -hmm. A second question has come up as to the operation of the system. I suggest that we, if you have a quick answer, then I would invite you to give it. Otherwise, we can have a discussion on that a little bit later. Do you want to comment now, Brian? I, I can try a quick comment, the question. Yes, please. So, Sorry, um, I, I didn't have to. Who will, who will operate the transport as a service? Uh, would it be private stakeholders in a public utility, the communities, or would it be free for all? So different questions. Hey, with the context of the UK, the, the general trend is to have public transport operation undertaken by the private sector. So we, we, we're trying to establish the business case to, to stimulate some private sectors and whether there's a partnership with the local authority to begin with to, to pump prime this service, that may, may come ahead, but we're really looking to move it into the commercial sector very quickly. It's not the role of UK uh, local authorities to operate public transport services. That is a clear statement and a bizarre one in some countries, <laughs> but we understand yeah. the context. We, we, we're I'm slightly different in, in the way we deregulated our public transport operation in the UK. Yes, you are. Um, so, thank you again for your presentation. We're now moving from a city which is uh, 
under 100 years old to a city which is a several, several thousand years old, uh, but which is a great city too. Um, I'm talking about Rome, of course. Uh, Adriano, I will give you the everything that you have to have uh, in order to start your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Siegfried. Uh, yes, actually, I am from the University of Florence, so I moved some uh, year ago from the eternal city, Rome, to the to a beautiful city in itself, but it's more a Renaissance city, which is Florence. However, today I'm stuck in Rome because of the snow. We just had 40 centimeters of snow tonight, so I couldn't take a train this morning. However, I was I managed to actually get connected no matter what. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you about is uh, the role of automation in public transport and specifically I will use my experience of coordinator of the City Mobile 2 project to actually uh, maybe making some controversial uh, statement. Um, what is City Mobile 2? I think that this is a so well known project that we decided not to explain it into details. I will just say that it has been, it's concluded one year and something ago, uh, it has been the most, uh, the widest European initiative on fully automated road transport systems. Uh, from 2012 to 2016, we carried seven large scale demonstrators in which we brought 60,000 passengers on fully automated minibuses on shared infrastructures on public roads. So based on this experience and whatever we made afterwards, uh, we actually devised a very interesting uh, approach uh, to, to automation for public transport, which I will talk through you uh, about. But I would like, first of all, uh, to see whether we can go to the um, first poll we have two polls just at the beginning the first is uh, um, how and where do you expect uh, automation to be first deployed whether it will be in privately owned vehicles ride shared vehicles or public transport i don't know serious if you can uh, maybe uh, show the poll it is on their screens now let's wait for some votes Okay, we have about 60% of the votes, 70. A couple of more seconds. All right, I'm closing the poll now, sharing the results. So about 16% think uh, it should be deployed through privately owned vehicles. 27% think it should be uh, through ride sharing or vehicle sharing. And 53% think road-based public transport, which is the main focus of uh, this presentation. And 4% say none of the above or other forms. Right. Okay, thank you very much. So the, whether you want to go back to the presentation or show directly the next poll, I don't know. The next poll is basically how significant of an impact do you expect automation to have on public transport? And it ranges from none, it changes nothing, to low, it could support, but I'm, but I'm not sure, to up to level five, which is significant and will transport public transport as, as we know it. Okay. Sirius, can you launch the poll? Mm -hmm. There you go. Uh, there was, uh, there's been a mistake with the uh, options. Uh, please select only one option, uh, one um, choice. Okay, we have 75%. I'm closing the poll now. So about four, okay, 0% think nothing will change. So there will always That's be good. a change. 13% <laughs> say uh, the impact would be low. 43% say medium. It could lead to new public transport services. 30% say the impact would be high which means will make public transport more attractive compared to other modes. And 23% think 
it will definitely be significant and it could possibly transform public transport as we know it. Actually, I'm really, really very glad to see how well uh, you are uh, convinced that automation will be a revolution because it will be a revolution. It will either be the revolution that launches a new uh, century uh, public transport uh, service or it will be the revolution that destroys public transport service for good. If we can go back to the presentation, uh, you will see in this slide a, a quick comparison between uh, our shared vehicles, our uh, public transport vehicles on the right hand side of City Mobile 2 and the Google car. Basically, which is the great difference between these two technologies? Well, first of all, the Google car is conceived to be door to door. So they plan to share in terms of ownership, but not to share in terms of ridership. The vehicle, in fact, is small uh, and you will only share it with the people you uh, share the trip with. So the people, I mean, the people who are traveling with you, while in the other case, you definitely share it. And in one case, you go from door to door, uh, always in the same vehicle. In the other case, you just are brought to the next station of another kind of transport uh, service, which might be more suitable for that kind of journey. So it is, by definition, multimodal. However, from this, it descends the next two bullet points that the Google car needs to go from anywhere to anywhere and using any kind of infrastructures. Actually, this is very very difficult to do because it means that the vehicle needs to be able with only its technology on board to actually navigate no matter what infrastructure on our end we basically use our service only on pre-selected routes and only on certified eventually adapted infrastructures and we will have full supervision. So basically you will have a control center in which there will be a human ready to intervene in case there is anything that, that doesn't go. Now this make a huge difference also in technological terms because while the Google car needs to, do, to deal with everything on its own, it needs to have the technology on board to be able to repair itself, to detect its fault, to be able to work even if it's not working. So, for example, they have a three redundant steering actuator. They have redundant power because you cannot have the battery that simply goes off and leave the vehicle where it is. You, they need to have redundant sensing, redundant everything, which not only makes more costly the vehicle, it also makes it more complex. While on our case, as we only use our pre-certified infrastructures, we have very well uh, conceived behaviors. In case we have anything that goes wrong, we have already conceived fail-safe operations. So what we do is basically, if the, the, the light goes off, if the, the battery is no longer powering, basically, brakes are pre-actuated. So the vehicle will slow down and stop exactly in its trajectory. It will be, of course, a service disruption, but it will not hurt or kill or do anything wrong to anybody. Also dealing with other users is incredibly different because Google needs to forecast what the other users are doing. So they, they need to basically not only detect where they are or where they're going, but also try to forecast whether they will change their direction, go one day, one way, the other. I mean, this is, don't get me wrong, it's an absolutely beautiful technology. However, to make it work for real, it will take a huge amount of time. And you will never be completely sure that it will actually be working you will never be able to demonstrate in a deterministic way that the technology is working. While on our side, what we do is an integrated safety assessment. So what we do is that our infrastructures will be uh, investigated beforehand and you will actually know where you have to slow down beforehand because you know that that part of the infrastructure is more dangerous. And in this case, you can simply react to anything that goes wrong by braking. And this goes the same with dealing with external problems. The Google car needs to recognize police, roadworks, etc. We can just communicate with a control room. Now, when you actually use these, we basically were able to transport safely uh, 60,000 passengers on, low, on our low speed last mile shuttles, 
sharing urban street with anybody else. And we learned that using these technologies on public transport is already feasible today. It doesn't need any trial. It doesn't need any more demonstrations. We know how to do it. We know how to do it well. And of course we do it safely, but remember this. There is no magic wand. Technology doesn't solve all the problem. A lot of people today behave badly on the street. Well, in Italy, maybe more than any than uh, other way, uh, other places in Europe. But still, people behave badly on the infrastructures because it is the common behavior to behave badly. It is normal not to respect rules on the street. While if you do not respect rules, you cause safety threats. And safety threats will not be solved all simply by technology. So if you design your system to become safe through a thorough urban integration study, it will actually be safe and so much safe to become rail safety standards, a hundred times safer than your current uh, system. Second important point, speed is crucial for everything. First is crucial for customer satisfaction but also is crucial for financial purposes. If I operate at 10 kilometers per hour, I will need more vehicles to carry the same amount of people. So I will need to invest more money to get people in uh, the same amount of people for the same trips and carry them to less satisfaction to them. If I were just able to increase from 10 to 20 kilometers per hour, I would actually need half the investment and I would make people twice as happy. So how can I actually go from something which is low because so safe to something which is which has the right speed? Well, I basically, and once again, this is how I do it. I do it through a thorough urban integration study. Final point, though we enable services, transport services, public transport services in low demand areas, and whoever deals with public transport knows that carrying uh, public transport in uh, conventional public transport in low demand area is a bloodbath because it basically requires a lot of vehicles a lot of uh, investments just for very little ridership so even if we enable that especially in the medium term at present it is really crucial to the to the service success to start in places in which we can actually have some level of ridership to demonstrate that we can actually have solved the main public transport problem, which is that public transport today is not financially self-sustainable. Now, I've talked so much about urban integration that you might be scared of what uh, urban integration might mean. So I just took a picture out of Google Maps uh, of the a street in Delft, which shows a perfect integration, which was not made for automated vehicles. It was made basically just to keep the maximum of safety. As you see, you have on the left-hand side pedestrians, and then you have separate from the pedestrians, the bike lane, and then again, separate from the main road, you have the, the bike lane is kept separate from the main road through a cushion of grass. Why this is so important? Because if a biker fell, it doesn't fall in the middle of the street. So you can actually avoid to slow down when you are overtaking a biker. So this is a crucial uh, urban integration part. And you see the, the final part here is that the median of the street has a soft segregation. So it's not impossible to actually change lane. It's just that you do not do it just because you you went wrong and so you have two you serve two purposes with that median first you can teach to the manual driver that if it's touching with the wheel that median the the, the steering wheel start uh, vibrating so this means that basically he will know that is touching the median so if he doesn't intend to he will remain on the on his lane but the other crucial thing is that the median is large enough to allow a little bit more room for the sensors to detect wrongdoing and understanding whether it's necessary to break or not. 
you cannot actually have a fully automated vehicle speeding up close to another vehicle because this means that if the other vehicles weigh for any reason the automated vehicle has no other option than crashing into it while this is of course for safety reasons to be avoided so what is the main problem of public transport and how automation can help if we have origin and destinations of a trip in the outskirts of a city the main problem today for public transport is basically bringing people last mile to the uh, main public transport line you see the blue segment that brings to the dotted line then you can have your trip by moving on your existing public transport network which can have a radial line and a circular line and at the end you can find another uh, automated vehicle waiting for you uh, at the end however the interesting thing is that we can fully automate vehicles for uh, the first last mile but also we can provide vehicles which are partly automated for example you drive a shared car to the station then park the car at the station and the car very slowly goes back to serve the next customer so you basically have a fully automated well you have the same effect of a fully automated service but you actually do it with the current state-of-the-art technology keeping low demand uh, sorry low speed services but also on the yellow uh, circular line most of the cities don't have public transport circular public transport which are that effective and with that you can for example do bus platooning so you have several mini buses coming from different direction which goes all to form a platoon with just one driver in a in a platoon of six seven uh, small buses which basically gives you the capacity of a tramway with the investment of a bus line so what we can actually do first well ride share cars to the train stations and relocate them empty using either automation or platooning depending on the local legal framework small 30 places electric buses which can uh, operate uh, on demand for the last mile and in platoon at high speed which means 70 kilometers per hour on high capacity corridors and all this can be done without the revolution of needing to buy many new vehicles but actually simply retrofitting automation on existing vehicles this is the quick and fast way public transport has today to be automated much much sooner private vehicles can be automated actually this is the most crucial thing because that you believe it or not this is a war if you allow vehicles private vehicles to become fully automated before you actually have made your public transport using automation features much more performing and much more attractive well the business for public transport might be at an end and this can be really a problem for the sustainability of the cities the second crucial point is that existing business models for cities uh, transit operators car makers etc will all cease to exist a new blurred rights uh, right services will replace them all and cities will need to be able to actually guide this process because otherwise you will find out exactly with what you do not want so you have a time window which is very very short five seven year not to start automating public transport but to complete public transport automation so to actually have it so well working that when in five ten years automated taxi services from bmw from google from mercedes from no matter who will become available they will have no customers because people will be so much accustomed to the new form of public transport that they will not need to buy new cars they will not seek for alternatives and this is the only thing that can save the sustainability of living in your cities now before thanking you for listening and of course leaving you my email address you should you have any questions or anything uh, please email me i will be very glad to to take it over i also would like to show the cover of the book 
that out of the City Mobile 2 experience is about to be published. It is released from Elsevier, the international publisher, on April 1st. So thank you, Adriano, for this great presentation. Thank you also for the element of drama which we enjoyed. Um, are there any questions? Uh, there is a question which I will bring up, a written question, uh, but please add more questions in the chat box. Um, your main message, Adriano, is that cities have five to seven years in, an, in order to implement, because technology is ready, humans are not, cities are not, but we should use these five to ten years in order to get ready and to convert conventional collective mobility to automated mobility. Is that correct? It is. Actually, you can already see it with Uber in London, in San Francisco, in many places. In They showed uh, ridership for conventional public transport declining. As soon as you get new forms of transport available, which are more convenient, uh, the, the conventional public transport is getting less and less passengers. Uh, this was true, it has been true, for example, for the Autolib uh, uh, service in, in Paris as well, but not so much. Now, the more the new service will be convenient, so the cheaper and the better the service will be, the more it will subtract users to public transport. So the only real way for, for cities to defend themselves is to actually give to citizens high quality public transport in a way that they will ne that citizens will never require to have anything different because it will be cheap and excellent at the same time and actually there's nothing better than ride a train downtown because it's fast because it's clean because it's safe because it's everything you need but the problem is actually go to train station and most of all once you reach the other train station go to destination because very seldom your destination is in a train station. Okay, good. I think this is clear. Now let's come to questions. Uh, the first one, um, um, sorry, <laughs> I'm struggling. Um, the first question, um, do you think that your system would be ready to operate without a steward, a driver, just in case? So We already operated say, without a steward. We okay. already operated without a steward in Greece. Uh, there was a legal framework that allowed, and we did that. Actually, they used the scapegoat of a remote driver, which I don't particularly like, but I mean, this was the, the, the legal framework in Greece, and we used it. The, the problem of the steward is, uh, as I see it, more a problem of uh, not being confident with the technology. But once you are confident with the technology, if you have the legal framework to allow, that allows you really don't need a steward. Mm. So this was another question. People are really, participants are really questioning your view. Another question is, do you really think that automated shuttles are mature and ready to implement? Your answer is clearly yes. My answer is that shuttles might not be the answer to everything. So we, de we demonstrated shuttles because this was what we could do with the amount of money we had uh, from the European Commission. We do not believe shuttles to be the answer to all the problems. So shuttles can be a marvelous uh, solution for uh, last mile services close to a, a train station. Yes, this is a, a, a technology which is mature and we demonstrated and works. Uh, however, as I was saying in my presentation, the next step is higher speed. I mentioned 70 kilometers per hour. It's platooning, and uh, so it means not just small vehicles, but platooning of larger vehicles. And most of all, what I said is ride-shared vehicles, which might even be at some point manually driven by one customer. So a shuttle are one arrow in the uh, one one tool in the in the toolbox. You mm -hmm. have many different tools, and depending on the place in the city, there may be different different solutions. Okay. Uh, another question is, what should cities do in order to start reconstructing infrastructure? What would be the first steps? The first step is a safety analysis. Safety analysis for existing transport. If you know that, that your uh, road 
do have accidents, don't just blame drivers. Okay. In, in those places, in the Netherlands, in France, uh, in Japan, uh, wherever there has been uh, a safety analysis, already modification to the, the, the road layout has been made. And those modified streets are perfect for fully automated vehicles. As I just mm -hmm. showed, the example of Delft is an example in which we, we did do nothing. I mean, I just took the example as it is. It was uh, perfectly made without me saying, I need this or that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to read a question. It is a bit longer. Uh, it is a question from Helsinki, uh, where the person just started a new European level automated vehicle public transport project that will lead to piloting fully automated vehicle last mile solutions in 2020. This project focuses on how cities can use automated buses in a systematic way. What do you see? as the biggest challenge in combining existing public transport system with automated vehicles? The biggest challenge is that uh, uh, right now we are thinking to automated vehicles as uh, different vehicles, uh, while automated vehicles are simply existing vehicles in which uh, automation uh, replaces the driver. So the main problems that shuttles do have today is that they are electrically and mechanically weaker than uh, conventional vehicles. Of course, they are very young. They haven't made many, many miles traveled. So this is the, their main problem. However, the same concept, the same guidance technology, which, have, which are applied to the shuttles, can really be applied to any buses, to any car. And then you can create brand new transport services. And don't forget my last bullet in the conclusions they will become or blurred services. It will not exist anymore, a clear one service. Even the bus corridor, it might be a bus corridor at peak time, and then it just can be, for example, a, a reserved lane for automated cars uh, uh, of peak. Automated shared cars, of course. Okay, uh, thank you. I would now like to... Um ask the other participants also to come online again. Uh, so Brian, could you join? Uh, because there are some general questions. And also Bernard, please join me here. Um, one question, early question actually today was, what about freight transport? How do you see, you presenters, how do you see freight transport in this topic? Uh, Brian, um, is there anything going on in your city? Yes, uh, we, we, we are exploring uh, freight delivery from uh, auto, autonomous small deliveries. Uh, I, I think it's like the general trend in, in mobility for people in that, that we put in more and more demands on what we want uh, so that instantly, so the self gratification of getting our deliveries very quickly has meant that the, the transmodal into smaller deliveries for personal use is, is, is a trend that we are noticing and how that can be automated to, to meet with people's requirements and also the city's requirements to allow those freight deliveries to happen in the most sustainable way. So uh, on the routes we're creating in Milton Keynes, we're also creating a freight network for small vehicles to deliver autonomously, and that could be to the workplace, to the home, or, or to the, the, the tailgate of the vehicle. Uh, so we're exploring how that might happen and how we might transship that freight from the edge of the city uh, where we might not in the center of the city want to welcome the typical diesel delivery van in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if I may complement to this, uh, I would say that uh, I would divide the freight problem into the urban last mile delivery which is one thing. And the other thing is the interurban trips for freight. And uh, the interurban trips, I, th I see a, a huge revolution coming with the truck platooning. Because truck platooning uh, basically will make much cheaper to bring uh, goods on roads, even, uh, even goods that were used to go to uh, inland waterways or, or rail. So this means that uh, there will be a, an important model shift uh, unfortunately, in the direction of the unsustainable thing. And this is something that cities and, and uh, national authorities need to think about very carefully. Okay. Uh, thank you. One last question also to the other speakers. 
Uh, how do you see the relationship between cycling, non-motorized transport in general, and automation? Is it the fight for the space on the road, segregated lanes for everybody, and then maybe cyclists being second priority? Uh, or is it an opportunity with uh, bikes perhaps being brought on automated vehicles to enable them to make longer trips? Uh, Brian, could you ask answer first? Um, I, I think that the, there is an issue. In, in fact, while we've been online, I've, I've received a, an email that suggests a cyclist is unhappy because they came across one of our autonomous freight vehicles. So we, we, we've not cracked that one yet. We've got to learn from the, the experimentation we're undertaking within the cities and ensure that we don't do things to harm what is still a primary focus for our city is to promote healthier options of walking and cycling. So again, in the, in the words of the project, we've got to think long and hard about the coexistence, and it's the learnings we're taking. If we do, we 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 have a principle of we want to be infrastructure light, but uh, respecting uh, Adriana's point, safety has to be paramount. We need to learn from the experimentations and create the toolkits to allow the coexistence of cyclists, pedestrians, autonomy, especially where they're, they're on shared services. So. There's still a bit of work to do there, and, and we're not ignoring it. A quick answer from Adriano. Um, I think that even in, in cycling or in, uh, in walking, uh, the, the differences must be made. For example, there is this beautiful example of the use case in, um, in Gothenburg that we are dealing with in the Coexist project, in which you have these shared spaces. The shared spaces will always have priority for for uh, bikers and for uh, pedestrians. And in fact, we are struggling to find uh, the possibility for automated vehicle to, to move because when you have when you are in a very crowded environment uh, and you want to be safe, the automated vehicle simply stops and waits for having a free space, which almost never happens. If you are thinking of longer distance journeys, this is a more um, a trickier part because you really cannot mix uh, uh, vehicles or modes that are going at different speed. If you have a bike that goes uh, at 20 kilometers per hour, or sorry, in the Netherlands at 30 kilometers per hour, uh, it's um, you you actually cannot mix it with with vehicles going at 70. That's that's pretty clear. So you need to have separate lanes. Uh, fortunately, if automation is very well implemented, and if it is implemented in a direction and with policies to actually have uh, uh, um, more use of shared vehicles, then this will decrease the overall number of vehicle mile traveled, freeing a lot of space on, uh, on uh, the infrastructures, which will allow us to actually reinvent the space in a new way. Thank you very much, Adriano. Um, we really must come to the close. Uh, can I ask the final question to Bernard? Uh, so this afternoon, what should cities, representatives of cities, be considering of doing as a first priority? I mean, first of all, I think it's important to say that cities should not get uh, distracted uh, by the future and to, to use this kind of uncertainty as an excuse of not acting. And that was the main message, I think, from my presentation, that cities can act now and whether this is actually already deploying uh, public transport vehicles like um, or shuttles or pods like in Milton Keynes or just start off basically with the planning process or with a visioneering process because if you ask these questions related to what will automation do for freight or what will automation do for walking and cycling I think at this moment there's two scenarios there can be a heaven scenario and there can be the health scenario in all these cases but very important is that the cities together internally, but also externally with their stakeholders start formulating basically a wish list about what automation should really bring to them and so how can automation support their mobility goals. Okay. Thank you very much, Bernard. This was a good uh, final set of comments. Uh, we're a little bit over time. We had, looking at the statistics now, uh, almost 100 participants uh, most of you have stayed for the entire time, a few had to leave, but most are still on. Thank you very much for attending, have a great afternoon. Thank you. Greetings from Rome, from Milton Keynes and from Cologne. So, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, bye everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.